Hello, I'm Linda Yu, an economist and author of The Great Economists. Welcome to this special video episode of the Intelligence Squared podcast. I'm delighted to speak with Carl Bergstrom and Javin West about their new book, Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. Carl is an evolutionary biologist and professor at the University of Washington, where he studies how epidemics spread through populations and information flows from the intracellular control of gene expression to the spread of misinformation on social media. Jevin is an associate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington. He's the director of UW Center for an Informed Public and co-director of his data lab, where he studies the impact of technology on society. Welcome to you both. And first of all, why did you two write a book together about BS? Carl first. Oh, well, um, so actually, this, in, this story about this was kind of interesting. Jevin is sort of the architect of the data science curriculum at the University of Washington. And, uh, and at some point, he called me up and said, hey, Carl, I'm going to start teaching this class on big data. And I said right away, because I'm a bit of a skeptic around big data, oh, cool, then I'm going to start teaching a class calling bullshit on big data. And Jevin laughed. And, uh, and then, um, and then uh, I said, well, I, actually, that sounds like a lot of fun. Let's, let's do it. And he said, yeah, let's do that. And so we started you know, just thinking about what would go into a class that was aimed at deflating some of the hype, uh, the unnecessary hype around big data. And then as we started to put that together, we realized it was really unfair to limit it just to big data. And we had to think more generally about all the kinds of misinformation that were uh, that, was, that was kind of coming through in the form of statistics and, and numbers and, and general kind of quantitative analysis. And as we kept you know, thinking about the scope of that, it eventually evolved into the uh, course that we teach called Calling Bullshit at the University of Washington, which was in turn sort of the inspiration for the book. Okay, Jevin, let's hear your version. <laughs> I think Carl's version, I don't call BS on that at all. That's, that's spot on. I can, I can establish that as a, as a fact. Um, and, and I think to add on to that, I think one of the things that Carl and I recognized um, as educators and researchers um, in the quantitative STEM areas of science is that we're great at universities at teaching people how to do the mechanics, how to replicate algorithms, how to replicate statistical methods, but we don't ask them to question the data and the presentations and the, um, and the, and the many problems that can arise when dealing with data. We just sort of assume that data is true and, and we just don't teach them to question enough. And so I think it was one of the most important things that we could do for the students was to teach them about that. And then of course, 2016 hit, uh, of course, a lot of the ramifications of you know, social media has really hit us hard uh, in, in the face um, around the world. And, and I think also, um, the impact of, of misinformation and disinformation spreading. And so it was a confluence of a lot of things. And now I truly think it's the most important course that Carl and I can teach. And, and fortunately, we have lots of colleagues around the world that are teaching various versions of it, uh, their own versions, of course, too, and, and sort of collaborating on this bullshit movement that's happening in education. <laughs> well, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. So thank you very much for writing it. And I'm gonna check out your course as well. So let's just start with, what is BS? You quote a philosopher who described BS as what people create when they try to impress you or persuade you without any concern for whether what they are saying is true or false, correct or incorrect. So tell me, how do you two uh, define BS, which you do obviously in your book, Carl? Well, so we, we define it as um, something fairly close to, to Harry Frankfurt's definition that you just described. We define it as language or statistical graphics or figures, um, other forms of presentation that are designed to um, persuade somebody by impressing them or by overwhelming them, intimidating them even, um, with a blatant disregard for truth or logical coherence. And so it's really key to uh, recognize that what you're, what the, person who's BSing is doing is trying to um, create, uh, you know, belief or at least in, uh, prevent anyone from questioning them by uh, hitting them with a deluge of 
information in this case, in, in, in our book, our, the focus is on what happens when that deluge of information takes quantitative form. Uh, Jeff, and I'm going to um, pose a slightly different question to you about the origins of BS, because in the book, you also write about Sigmund Freud, who wrote in 1884, I quote, so I gave my lecture yesterday, despite a lack of preparation, I spoke quite well and without hesitation. All that matters is that they get the impression that I understand it. So I'm sure that's an experience none of you have ever had, but tell me about the origins of BS. How far back does it go? Well, I would even turn to Carl on this one because he, he studied this sort of topic when looking at animals and, and how it might even have arisen, or at least there may be aspects of bullshit in the animal kingdom. And, and, and actually we, we talk about that in the book. I love the, the, the quote that you mentioned, Carl and I have had a good laugh at that one. And, and anytime we show students on that particular quote, they, they get a kick out of it because they know we are part of that as, as academics that are trying to finish a lecture and then trying to impress our students. But I think the origins go far deeper than even just human communication. They may even go as far as, as animal communication. And I would sort of look to Carl because he's the, the real expert on that. Yeah, so I mean, I you know I, I uh, have worked on animal communication and animal deception for many years, and so I couldn't help but want to talk about that a little bit in the book. And and animals uh, deceive and mislead each other a lot. Uh, so there are these you know various animal signaling systems, and we tell stories in the book. We tell a story about a kind of a, 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 a crustacean called a called a, a, a stomatopod or a mantis shrimp, and and w they wave their claws around aggressively uh, to try to to try to frighten. Um, competitors away but the thing that's really cool that they do is that uh, they bluff and so when they're molting and they are unable to fight they still do this claw, claw waving display um, and uh, and and hope that the opponent just doesn't catch on and and backs down anyway so there's no truth to the threat they they're they're they don't have a shell they can't actually pinch with the pinchers, but, uh, um, but they nevertheless uh, act as if they do. And so this is a bluff. And then we go from there and we think about the way that if you have a theory of mind and you can, and you can kind of predict what somebody else might think in response to something that you do, you can bluff in even more sophisticated ways. And we talk about you know, one recent experiment that shows that ravens do this. And, and so you know, I think we probably can go back to some forms of deception that, that start long before human communication ever arose. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so you write about the fact that BS is everywhere, so from animals to people. So um, Jevin, what is it about people and complex language um, which has enabled all the varieties of BS that you write about in the book? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, it's when, when there's limited resources, and in the case of the world right now, limited attention online, we're in this attention economy where those that are good at bullshitting tend to get that attention and, and they do it well, whether it's platforms, individuals, propagandists, opportunists, sellers, marketers. In order to, to sell the things that they want to sell us, they need to grasp our attention. They don't really care you know, necessarily what we believe. So if you're a, you're a teenager in Macedonia um, trying to create news that Americans will click on, they don't care whether Trump or Clinton actually wins the election. They just want you, you know, in 2016, they just wanted you to click on ads. And so it can come in terms of headlines that are catchy. It can come in terms of the car salesman <laughs> that you, you know, down the street. It can come in, in, the, in, in you know, selling ideas in science sometimes too, mm -hmm. sadly. Um, and so it comes in all these different forms. Some are more, uh, have neg more negative effects than others. But I think nowadays, especially in the world in which we live, we have to be more and more um, aware of these things to be able to spot it. And importantly, as we talk about in the book, because we call it calling bullshit, to be able to, to refute in effective ways with sort of civics on our mind as well and not just going after every little small thing that we see out there because it is just infinite out there there's an infinite resource and i'll say one last thing carl and i say that you know it's important to be carbon neutral um, nowadays but it's also important to be bullshit neutral as well so we all create bullshit let's figure out ways to to neutralize some of that and call some of it in effective ways as well 
<laughs> That's a great, um, for both of you, a great um, intro into the book, the kind of the two parts of it. I want to now just explore some of the forms of BS before we go into the, how do you um, make yourself skeptical so you can really call out BS when you see it. So let's start with paltering. So you find that this term paltering means that it's better to mislead than lie outright. And that's what paltering is. So Carl, tell us about Bill Clinton and the use of the word is. Okay, so there's this famous example where, um, uh, where Bill Clinton in his uh, defense against, or his, maybe his lawyer said this, I can't remember, but in the defense against Im impeachment, um, one of the arguments was, uh, well, did I lie? Well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. And so this was sort of the famous defense. And, 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 um, and what, what the argument was, uh, essentially, um, you know, was that Clinton had said something along the lines of there, you know, um, I'm not, uh, you know, there's no sexual relationship with that woman or something like that. And, uh, and so what he, um, was trying to convey the impression of was that there is and never had been. Uh, but what he then fell back on as a defense was he was saying it was over. And so he was, so he was trying to, you know, make you think that he uh, was denying any involvement at any point in any time, but he was leaving himself this sort of uh, linguistic out, this, you know, this linguistic back door to be able to say, oh, I never meant to, to, to give you that impression. And the reason this happens is because, you know, we, we very rarely uh, say precisely the, uh, the meaning that we're trying to convey. We, we use what's known as implicature in the philosophy of language in order to, in order to do that. Um, and uh, so, you know, for example, if Jevin asks me, um, hey, do you know where I can get a beer around here? And I say, there's a great bar down on the corner. Um, I, that Jevin can infer from the fact that I choose to mention that, that, uh, you know, the bar is open and that it serves beer and, 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 and that he would like it and all of these other things. I don't have to say all of that. Um, but because of this, we can, people can misuse implicature as well, and you can you can see uh, examples of that. You say so, you know. Well, what do you think of, uh, um, you know, what do you think of Jevin as a as an employee? Well, he doesn't he he doesn't do hard drugs on the job, um, and you know that that you know which is a true statement um, because he doesn't do hard drugs. Period. But if I say that, it makes you think that I'm you know saying something really negative about Jevin. But then of course, if he tries to sue me or something like that, then I say, well, it's, it's true, isn't it? Or 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 am I wrong about that? And, and so this is implicature and it's a way that people use to, to, to kind of BS. Um, but then later when called on it, say, you know, well, everything I said was true. I mean, Devin does not use hard drugs on the job. I swear to you. That's, uh, and I, I don't think don't, he'd dispute so. that. It's, uh, un unlike yeah. Sigmund Freud, uh, that's a separate, in your yeah. quotation. <laughs> that's that's Sigmund Freud actually did, yeah. Oh, that's right. The part of the quote I was shortening it was that um, he was so confident, apparently, because of some a little bit of drug use in there. So exactly, <laughs> but, uh, use, I think either, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the um, in the book you write about this plausible deniability, which we sort of now associate with lawyers and politicians, and that gets to this kind of almost taking advantage of the fact that lots of us say things, and there's a literal meaning, and then there is the inferred meaning. So you explain yeah. that. Um, in an extremely interesting way, Carl. Um, so, Javin, I want to turn to you about another form of BS, weasel wording, <laughs> which you describe in the book as the difference between what a sentence literally means and what it is used to mean. So, we just discussed this example of how um, you're not, you do not do hard drugs at work. <laughs> so, just say a bit more about how this is a form of BS and allows people to not take responsibility for things. And that's perhaps why um, we see it so often. Well, and I think it's very related to the, 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 the previous discussion that it's not, you know, the literal meaning which you're saying, and it's defensible in court, it's defensible even in the court of social media or whatever, if, if needed, um, but you're certainly conveying something else. Actually, one of my favorite quotes, and I won't be able to say it verbatim because actually, uh, it, Carl, this is the, the quote um, from The Simpsons about weasels. Uh, oh, actually, yes, yes, jazz, yes. Yeah, so weasel, weasel wording. I, I think I can probably do it verbatim. Um, so so um, 
so Bart Simpson is trying to weasel out of something at the dinner table and Marge is scolding him and, and Homer, and I'm not going to attempt a Homer voice, but Homer <laughs> says, you know, Marge, don't discourage the boy. Uh, um, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's weaseling. Uh, that's what, dis that what, that's what uh, distinguishes man from the animals. Well, except the weasels. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but I mean, we see this a lot, right? So this is like this is your kind of classic sp co corporate spokesperson talking about um, you know how uh, how this was an integrated you know how how integrated decision making with with multiple stakeholders uh, failed in a, in a bilateral fashion. You know, instead of like actually like just saying you know we screwed up uh, in this negotiation or whatever. It's there's always this you know passive voice and all of this you know sort of diffusion of responsibility away from things um, and and sort of a refusal to identify uh, uh, you know who's involved and so on so so before you join Carl uh, Linda and I were talking about in faculty meetings you can play bingo of different sorts and the most oh, yeah. on bingo is called weasel word bingo and, and oh, yeah. very much related to the corporate speak that you I'd like to get about. your I'd like to get your uh, weasel cards or bingo cards or <laughs> it does help pass the time the <laughs> um, so Jevlin, I want to explore, and um, you talked about this BS movement, uh, BS studies that some were beginning to, uh, to see. So in the book, you write that the most important principle in BS studies is Brandolini's principle. Quote, the amount of energy needed to refute BS is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. So tell us the example that you write about regarding vaccines and autism. Yeah, so the reason why this principle is so important is that we're seeing it play out all the time. It's easy to push out a tweet that's false, um, but sometimes the cleanup can take uh, years. It can get in the way of real healthcare workers. So for example, in the Pacific Northwest right now and in the West Coast more generally, we're having one of the worst fire seasons we've ever seen. But the problem is that these um, call centers, like the 911 call centers and the emergency responders are being flooded with rumors by citizens claiming that there was Antifa or Proud Boys that were starting fires in their area. And what that does then causes all this problem. This, that simple sort of tweet or Facebook post can cause problems. And so the examples that we talk about in the book that really display this principle and the damage it can have are the, 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 the anti-vaccination movement that has many of its roots, not all of its roots, but some of its roots to some very high profile papers that were published by Wakefield and, and others in these high profile, well-regarded um, journals. And those, we talk about it in depth, so I won't talk about it now, but the main, the main issue there is that that paper, even though it was formally retracted and even the authors themselves sort of retracted that particular piece of research, it's still cited often. And Wakefield himself, who was the lead author of that retracted paper and whose license had been revoked um, by the UK Medical Association, or I don't know the exact name of the association, he's still out giving advice, being the keynote speaker at anti-vaccination um, uh, conferences. And those, those communities are growing. It's actually an area that we're studying um, more and more um, in depth um, in our center. We actually just hired a postdoc that spends her, has spent her career studying these communities. And when she looks at those individuals and she looks at the movement, they're growing despite the, the, the super important need right now for people to be open to vaccinations as potentially one exit strategy around this pandemic. So this, this paper and this individual and and that, you know, it, you know, it took time to write that paper, but not anywhere near the time it's taken other researchers, the money that it's taken to run study after study in countries across the world. So it's cost us, you know, conceivably hundreds of millions of dollars, likely cost many people's lives that didn't take vaccinations, that could have taken vaccinations and saved their lives. So the, those little um, events then can cause these reverberations um, down the line that are really hard to clean up and take far more effort. So I would say orders of magnitude rather than just even an order of magnitude greater to mm. clean it up than to create it. Well, what's fascinating to me in the book is that um, the fact that BS is so easy to spread and hard to redress, and it goes back a long way in history. So to give another quote from your book, another great quote, is Jonathan Swift, who you quote, who wrote in, nine, in 1710, um, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it so that when men come to be undeceived 
it is too late. Or like a physician who have found out an infallible medicine after the patient is dead. I picked that up actually, the rest of the quote from your notes. I do like full quotes. <laughs> I like you picked out the best, you know, bit obviously that um, truth comes limping after it. What a great image mm -hmm. um, that is. Um, before I move to how we can all become more skeptical, um, Carl, I want to ask you just one more question um, that we're all thinking <laughs> and that you pose the question in the book and then you answer it. So in the 21st century internet era, we all have smartphones. You ask, how could you BS someone who could check your claims easily, immediately, and costlessly? Why has the internet, in addition to other positive aspects, also triggered a BS pandemic of unprecedented proportions? Why, Carl? Tell us the answers. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it, it's complicated, but I can try to get to the, the, the heart of it. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that happened was as we switched from a world where, where information production was, was, uh, had to go through a set of gatekeepers. You know, if I was going to write a book, it had to go through professional editors. If I was going to make a video, it had to go through a video production team and producers and, and all of that. Uh, to a world where everyone could be a content creator. And this was a lot of the great promise of the internet was it was going to bring all of these voices in that previously hadn't had the uh, social or economic capital to make themselves heard. And to some degree, this all happened. Um, what the, came with it was this enormous deluge of information and a even greater increase in the pace at which information came uh, you know, at us. Um, exacerbated perhaps by uh, economic reasons to promote a 24-hour uh, news cycle and, and all of that. Um, and so we found ourselves with a filtering problem, essentially, is with all that information out there, what do we look at? And one of the solutions that has become very, very popular to the filtering problem is social media. So with social media, we replace professional editors and the likes with all of us acting in a distributed fashion. So instead of an editor at Random House deciding what it is that I'm gonna read about, it's my conspiracy theorist, Uncle Ra, uh, who decides, oh, I'm gonna forward this thing that I just saw um, to everybody I know on, on Facebook. And so what's happened is we've all kind of stepped in and we've played this role of, uh, of, of editors and, and, and uh, you know, deciding who sees what. We're not necessarily trained for that. We don't necessarily have the incentives to get it right that other people do. And we often use this not as a way to actually inform people accurately about the world, but rather to just tell them that we're on their side. So, you know, I may be a, a real Trump hater. And so I might, you know, say forward a, a, a story about how Trump just sold the Washington Monument to a Russian oligarch. And uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't care if you believe it. I just want you to know that, you know, I'm on your side if you're, if you're, in, in that group, and you know, if you're a, if you're a if you're a, you know, a Trump supporter, then there are a different set of stories that you might forward, and so on. Um, so, so all of this happened, and then I think this gets badly exacerbated by the nature of the tech platforms themselves, of these uh, these social media platforms. So, these social media platforms are designed; uh, the entire user experience is designed to maximize your engagement with the platform, to keep you on the platform, to keep you clicking ads, as instead of going off and doing something else. And uh, so they're not designed to provide you with the most accurate or pertinent information. And so every, just sort of the very nature of, of, how, uh, of how information can go viral um, in the resharing technology there and all of that does this. Uh, what do people share? They share things that are inflammatory, that are shocking, that are surprising. That uh, and so, so the stuff that takes off has has those particular properties, which doesn't necessarily align very well with being accurate. And then you have this, you know, layered over all of that, you have a set of algorithms that the that the companies are using that are learning about all of us, both individually and collectively, in terms of figuring out what kinds of content appeals to people and gets reshared. And so the companies are constantly running these A-B type experiments where they're trying to see which versions of an algorithm keep people most likely to keep clicking on the platform and so on. And so they've learned you know, more about human psychology than, than you know, all psychologists in history in some level in terms of the amount of empirical data they have to work with. And so what this does is it keeps pushing us, uh, these algorithms themselves are pushing us toward information that maximizes engagement instead of maximizing 
uh, truth, accuracy, pertinence, any of that. And that makes the tech platforms themselves, in my view, you know, some of the biggest bullshitters out there because what they're trying to do is they're trying to impress us, they're trying to grab our attention uh, with a blatant disregard for the truth and uh, logical coherence of what they're feeding us. That leads me nicely actually to, uh, to you, Jevin, because I want to move on to how, given this environment, we can become skeptics, more skeptical. And so in the book, uh, you two write, straight up information cannot compete in this new marketplace. So how should we protect ourselves from misinformation and disinformation online? So say a bit more about, you mentioned uh, in the book, technology, regulation, education, that they all play a role. Yeah, they all do. I mean, it's not one of these problems where we can just look to policymakers or certainly not the tech world. Um, I think, you know, from my standpoint, I think from Carl's standpoint, I think informing the consumer is the most important long-term strategy that we can employ and short-term strategy too. I think as we talk with the public, we talk with students, we talk with, um, you know, just, just anyone who's willing to listen to learn about how this system works. What are the forms of manipulation that are happening to us all the time to, re to sort of remind us of the biases that we have, the confirmation biases that we have as humans to remind people of the economic incentives that are there um, to grab our attentions. The rise, for example, of QAnon is certainly due to certain kinds of, uh, you know, social issues that are going on, but it also is very much at the root, sort of a money-making um, endeavor for many of those, there's these three or four individuals that pushed QAnon after it arose first in 2017. I think teaching people to, you know, if they see an image, to do reverse image checks, to, you know, just ask if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, to corroborate, to triangulate. There's a series of things that we can do. We can create these habits of mind and become better. It doesn't make us completely immune to, to falling for misinformation. But I think we, all of us, not just students, not just the younger generation, older generation, we all, from K1 to K99, we all need to be um, just always practicing those kinds of things, just like we're sort of asked to go to gyms to sort of, you know, to be healthy or to walk outside. We have to do this every day and, and create these habits of mind and they integrate in everything we do. So I'd say education. We also need to reinvigorate local journalism. I think these kinds of things, if we looked at policy or we looked at things outside of, of, of media literacy, I would say the, the news deserts that are popping up in the United States and around the world, the local news deserts, I think we need to reinvigorate science writers and journalists too, because there's a real need for science education and we have you know, a paucity of, of, of science writers out there. And so there's a whole series of things that we can do, but as individuals, if you said, Jevin, that what's the one thing that you would do? I would say just pause, sort of think more, share less. We sort of say that a lot because a lot of what's happening is due to the sharing. It's due to algorithms facilitating that sharing, but it's us that shares that. And so individual tweets that start in small towns, like in our small town near where Carl and I live is Woodenville. There was a tweet that went out recently by a chiropractor saying that the, the numbers of COVID um, account accounts were much lower. They're around 9,000, not 180,000 in the U.S. Um, because of the, the comorbidities that were, um, the, the comorbidities of, some, of something like, uh, you know, if I die of a heart disease, it's still due to, um, to uh, you know, COVID, but this person was pushing this out. This got then tweeted by a QAnon follower, and then within, you know, probably less than a day, it reached all the way up to the leader of the free world, and he tweeted it out. So I think um, these are the kinds of things we need to be aware of how fast these things um, spread and we need to pause and, and, and not be a part of that spreading as much as we can. Mm. So Carl, I want to delve into um, some of this retraining of our mind with you with my next question. So um, you write uh, that context matters. So um, you have an example around why numbers, which seem like they're hard facts, why they're actually ideal, ve ideal vehicles for promulgating BS. So the example I want to, uh, to get you to talk about is rappers dying young, and that's why context uh, for numbers matters. Yeah, so I think, I mean, numbers have to be presented in ways, and this is a core message of the book, that allow you to make meaningful and valid comparisons. And numbers are very powerful vehicles for 
purveying misinformation because they feel objective and they feel precise and they feel scientific in ways that weasel words and various kinds of rhetoric don't. And so, um, so the example that you refer to is a, is a study that, that looked at uh, the age of death of musicians in different, um, in different genres. And what the study finds is that, uh, you know, musicians, famous musicians who are uh, blues or jazz or country stars um, live about as long as other people that were born at the same time as they were. Um, but famous musicians who are rappers um, have a much earlier age at death. And, uh, and, and, this, and this kind of gets at another issue, right, which is this issue of confirmation bias. We talk about trying to, uh, trying to build up habits of mind that keep you from falling for BS. And one of them is, is this notion of not uh, succumbing to confirmation bias. You know, if, if, if something confirms a belief that you already have, you know, oh, those kids with their music today, you know, it's dangerous and they shouldn't do that or whatever, um, you, you may be less likely to question it. And so people see that and they say, oh yeah, that music glorifies violence. And so, you know, I'm not surprised or, or have some sort of judgmental reaction like that where it's confirming their own beliefs and they don't necessarily question it. So if you, but if you step back and you question this, Jevin said earlier, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Well, if something seems too bad to be true, it probably is as well. And what this study showed is that uh, the average uh, age of rappers at death was about half the average age of the, of the population at large, uh, which is an, just an extraordinary um, you know, uh, mortality rate increase. And so if you go back and then you look at the data and you try to understand where these data come from, you find something kind of funny about this, which is that, the, uh, is, is that they, they haven't actually computed the life expectancy of rappers. They've said of the rappers who are dead, how old were they when they died? And so rap is a fairly new genre. People tend to, in new genres, tend, stars tend to be young when they start. There are not so many genres where the stars are in their 60s when the genre is formed. And so, you know, the reason that jazz musicians are, are uh, you know, living uh, normal life expectancies is that the, the ones who, you know, they've had enough time um, since the uh, it, it start of that particular musical genre um, to live a full life. Whereas what, with, what's happening with the rap stars is that if you're a rap star and dead, it means you died prematurely. And those are the only uh, examples that are being included in this data set, which paints this very misleading picture. It's a phenomenon known as right censoring uh, in, in statistics. Yes, that's right. I thought it was a great example. I mean, if rap is very new, then a lot of rappers are actually still alive. So if you cut off the observations today, right censor exactly. the data, and you go, oh, look, wait, hey, look, there's this, there's this mortality rate. So I thought it was just a great example about how we need to think hard about context. There was another example, Jevin, I'm going to point it to you that you give, which also makes us mindful of selection bias and why that can be very misleading. So. The example that you give is that a person's dating pool can show a negative correlation between attractiveness and niceness, even though there's no such correlation in the general population. <laughs> so tell us about selection bias and why it can be misleading. <laughs> yeah, I think this issue of selection bias could have been the entire book or should be an entire book. At one point, it was only going to be a small section of the book and then Carl and I sort of you know, went back and said, this has to be an entire chapter because you see it everywhere. And it's something that anyone can pick up. Even my nine-year-old and six-year-old now can pick this up and they look for it. So I think it's the type of thing that we have to be hitting over and over in, in, in classes. And so the example that you're talking about is something that actually comes from a colleague of our, Jordan, Jordan Ellenberg, who wrote a great book about, um, this, you know, the, about uh, sort of being more astute at, mis you know, identifying quantitative uh, BS. And he, so we borrowed this from his exam. How not to be wrong for people who are listening. Oh, Jordan's how not book, to be, yeah. how not to be wrong is at, excellent. Yeah, look at Jordan Ellenberg's book too. It's, it's a and, and, and a little bird tells me that there'll be other things to look for from Jordan Ellenberg in the future. So for people who've yeah. already read that, keep your eyes out. Keep your eyes out for something else coming. coming. So anyway, so this example is something that's called Berkson's Paradox, actually close to Bergstrom, so it's hard for me to say that because Bergson, Bergstrom, but, uh, but we don't have a Bergstrom paradox yet, but maybe we will at some point. 
Um, but Bergson's par paradox, uh, this is a great illustration of that particular paradox. And the idea is that there's really no, you can assume even that there's no correlation between someone's attractiveness, let's say, let's put that on the XY scale and the, and the, or in the X or the Y scale and the X scale might be um, sort of niceness. So the idea that you talk about in high school is that, oh, you know, the, the hot guys are always jerks and the, the not hot guys are not jerks. Um, and the idea is that as you, um, as you go into this selection pool and you start looking for, let's say, possible mates, it, it, it's likely that you're not going to necessarily choose someone that is, you know, absolutely a, a jerk and absolutely, and, and I've, unless you're, you know, um, you know, John Legend or something, you're also not going to be selected by those individuals. So there's two sort of selection events going on. It's a, it's a multi-selection event here. And when you do that, it's easier to show this visually. Actually, Carl may be writing it down. I don't know. Um, you, you can show it visually and you can actually see if you have sort of a gunshot set of data with no correlation, sort of dots everywhere on an XY plane. And then you do these selection events. You see that you get, um, you know, from both of these sort of this resultant because you're blocking out the triangles. And so you get this what seems to be this negative correlation between hotness and um, and niceness. And so in that case, you, you get this, um, what, you know, you get what you think is sort of someone that's always sort of hot is, is not nice and, and vice versa. But you see this all over. Actually, when you, when, when this was first ad addressed to me, I, I hadn't seen it, but now I see it all the time throughout. I mean, you see it, um, we talk about this example in the book from Google hiring, but you also see it in many other contexts. And so it's one of those things that sort of fits in the family of selection bias. And if you look for it, you'll find it in other places. Yeah, why are the best baseball hitters, uh, why, why, are the, why, are the, why are the best baseball hitters usually average fielders and the best uh, fielders usually average hitters? Um, well, it's because uh, you only need one or the other to make the show. And, uh, you know, so, so and then, you know, a simple way to explain what Jevons what, what Jevin was, was going through, I mean, you, um, you know, think, think about it, uh, you know, if someone's, if, uh, if someone's, if someone's super unattractive and super unpleasant, you're not going to date them. And if someone's super hot and super nice, they're not going to date you. And so that <laughs> generates this uh, correlation um, where the people that you're likely to actually be going out with are going to be, uh, you know, if they're, if they're, in, if they're extremely attractive, they're not, likely to be extremely nice and if they're extremely nice they're not likely to be extremely attractive and and so that's why we think that there's this correlation when there isn't one at least this is this is this is jordan's story and i'm sticking to it <laughs> it's a great example i think um, when you're relaying the examples in the book it really works because you've got these uh, you do the graphs in layers so you can kind of see the first cut no nah, i could go out with somebody who all right so they're a little bit attractive you know that's all right i'd look for them to be nice so you skew your little selection um, and then you look oh no wait who's going to choose me and then you finally <laughs> skew their selection and then you end up in this middle where you think oh no how do we end up with this negative correlation it's a brilliant example i encourage everybody watching and listening to get a book you must get the full impact of this it could actually help with understanding dating i mean think of that um, <laughs> um, but jevin i want to um ask you um one more area um, which can really help us, I think, read through the BS. So you cite this study in the book where one study, a set of studies found that nearly half the news articles um, that uh, describe um, a set of studies made unwarranted claims about causation. So you write, correlation doesn't sell newspapers. So this is I think your version of that um, very well-known uh, statement that you also have in the book, which is correlation does not equal causation. <laughs> but tell us about correlation not selling newspapers. Right. And I, that's Carl's comment. He came up with that. And it's, uh, it's brilliant. And I think it's a great way of explaining this idea. Because students think they understand correlation does not imply causation. When you mention it initially, they nod their heads and say, are we going to talk about something else? We know we understand that. And then you start asking them questions or you start evaluating how well they know this concept and they, they usually fail pretty miserably. We all do. It's a hard, it's a hard concept to um, not get caught by. And so, you know, this correlation causation sort of issue is, again, sort of something we devote an entire chapter to. And we sort of encourage people to sort of draw these diagrams out to really sort of think through this as carefully as possible. And I think one of the, um, the things that we talk about when we talk about newspapers, this particular article you referenced, actually you mentioned a half 
of the news articles in this, you know, top, these, these top obesity, I think it was obesity um, research articles were misappropriating uh, causation, but a third of the articles um, were also misappropriated by the authors themselves, the researchers themselves. So it's not just the journalists that are at fault, it's the researchers themselves too. And what happens because causation sells newspapers is they jump from you know, wine consumption, you know, even a well-described observation study might say, uh, actually, you know, many health uh, outcomes like, you know, exercise can reduce, um, uh, uh, exercise is associated with reduced cancer, you know, 26 cancers or whatever. And in, in, in that case, the researchers might have described it perfectly, but what, what do, you know, the news uh, editors write or the journalists themselves, they write that, you know, exercise five times a day and it'll reduce 10 cancers or something. And so they become prescriptive claims too. So prescriptive claims can create that sort of in, in um, they sort of infer the same kind of causality that just said, even if you said literally that exercise causes less cancer by saying that exercise, go exercise now and you'll reduce your cancer, prescribe it like a doctor would, that can, that can mean the same thing. And so we see this- I mean, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that if, if, if A doesn't cause B, you wouldn't say right. do A exactly. in order to bring about B, right? And so, so that's, and, but, but it's super boring to read newspaper articles that just say, hey, scientists, you know, did this huge observational study and they found nine correlations and here's one of them. Um, but it's, <laughs> yeah. but it's kind of interesting if it's like, you know, hey, uh, you know, want to, want to avoid cancer or you want to find a, find a, uh, partner who's both hot and uh, nice, you know, do this. And, uh, um, that's but, but, but the problem is not only does it confuse the public about what science says and what it doesn't, even within science, when we hype our work and when we create these causative claims, we sort of undermine uh, science by sort of, uh, sort of ignoring the scientific method. Um, there's, a, there's several people, philosophers of science that have been talking a lot about this and this hype is really damaging to the brand of science and what science is and what it's not. And I think that's, it's, I know that journalists need to sell newspapers and maybe they can sell them in ways that are interesting by saying, oh, this is, you know, the 450th article in this space, but this is different because, because there's interesting stories in there. It's just, I think we need to do a better job of explaining why that story is still interesting without making the ca causative claim. And it's a hard thing to do. I, there's, it's, it's not easy, much easier to say, Drink four glasses of wine today and you'll live four days longer in your life or something. That's much more interesting. Good deal. <laughs> um, I want to squeeze in one more example before I get you to, to kind of summarize uh, the spotting and then the calling out of BS. So, Carl, I'm going to put this to you. Data viz, data visualization, it's all around us. Tell us why it's also problematic. Yeah, so, I mean, data visualization is something that has really, really changed in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, it was fairly rare to see very sophisticated data visualizations in any kind of popular media. You'd see them in technical scientific papers, but you wouldn't see them in the newspaper or especially not on TV. And that's really changed as, as the world has changed around us. And as we live in a world where there's so much data available um, and, the, and the techniques and, and uh, tools for making elegant data visualizations have become very, very rich as well. So New York Times has this, uh, you know, large staff of 20 some people that make these amazing data visualizations uh, that help us understand the data that explain the world that we that we live in. So we're confronted with a lot of this. We haven't really been taught to reason about that the same way that we've been taught some other elements of media literacy because it's so new. And when you look at these data visualizations, they're showing numbers, they're ways of visualizing numbers. And so we feel like, okay, you know, as long as the New York Times didn't make up these numbers or, or you know, whatever the source is, you know, this must be an accurate representation of the world because these are hard numbers. Uh, and the thing that, that, that happens with data visualizations is that even if the uh, designer is using actual, real, true numbers, there's a tremendous amount of latitude that that designer has to change the way that you feel about those numbers. And so in the book, we go through a whole bunch of the tricks that, uh, that can be used either by accident or quite often on purpose to um, change the way you feel about numbers. And so one of the very you know, simple ones that, that I think you know, a lot of people see is you have these bar graphs 
um, that, that illustrate what appear to be massive differences between, uh, um, but but you know, but between two quantities. And then you look carefully, and actually the axis has been cut off. So uh, you know the difference. You maybe you're looking at uh, literacy rates. Um, and, and going from year to year, and, and it looks like you know one bar is three times as high as the other, but one bar is actually 92 percent, and the other bar is uh, is 94 percent, and it's been cut off at 91. And so it like it's making you feel like these are really big changes when actually they're quite small ones. So I think this is very very important because so much of the way that we consume numbers um, in and 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 uh, statistical information in general these days is through data visualization. And so being aware of the ways that that can mislead us is super important. Yeah, that was absolutely fascinating in your book, just um, looking at, look out for the zero. Does the graph start <laughs> with, a, is, this, is, it, is it a zero? Does it start at 91? So absolutely terrific. Um, and for people so who are excited about that, if I could just interrupt you, for, Alberto Cairo has this book called How Charts Lie. So if you want to yeah. see like our, our and it's just come out and if you want to see our chapter expanded into like a full-length book essentially um with some differences we you know i don't agree with alberto on everything and um uh that's an amazing read mm, thank you and um, this is great talking about your great book and we're getting all these great book recommendations <laughs> um so i'm going to give each of you a chance to sum up um so i'd like for you to essentially um you know, just tell us um, what you want us to take away in terms of spotting BS and calling out BS while avoiding coming across as a jerk, which is the final bit of advice you put in the book. So, um, Devin, I'm going to start with you because you've already given your mantra. Think more, share less. Yeah, I, I think this is really a book of empowerment. Um, it's when when we've shared it with friends and family, even before we sent it out, the response that we got, it, probably the best response we could have ever received is that people felt sm smarter, more empowered when they went into their business meetings or when they went into class and students would say, I wish I would have had this my freshman year. And I think it's as much an empowerment book as it is about the, some of the technical things that you should be looking out for. And so I would say that, um, don't be intimidated when you see data and misinformation. And yes, it can be exhausting to live in this digital environment that we are, but, but we all can become better at, um, at, at spotting it and importantly refuting it. It's one thing to spot it, and that's a great first step. And if that's the only step people get to, that's great, because it's gonna help that individual, that one person in either not spreading. But if you're willing to also take that extra step in calling and refuting, misinformation, either privately, and sometimes that's the best environment to do it, or publicly, I think that then helps all of us. So we end the book by saying that calling BS isn't just about making us look smarter and feel smarter, but it's also about making all of us smarter, the community smarter. And in order to do that, you have to take care when calling BS. And so we have a set of steps in the book that we say, you know, be, be clear, make sure that you're right, you know, don't attack the person. There's a whole series of things that you can do so you can be more confident when doing more public refutation. But that would be my quick summary. And, and, and it's not much of a quick summary, I guess, if it was supposed to be 10 seconds. But Carl, why don't you take a shot? <laughs> it could be much longer than 10 seconds. Don't worry, Carl, final word to you. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with Jevin. I mean, this, this is, a, this is a, a book about how um, the, the world of BS has, has moved from, um, you know, verbal assertions to actually quantitative misinformation. A lot of us are scared to challenge quantitative misinformation, both because the numbers seem objective, but also because we feel like, oh, well, I don't really, I'm not an expert in that area of statistics or in this kind of machine learning. And, and that's like, that's me and Jevin and anyone else, as well as, you know, it's not just the members public. I mean, whenever I read a scientific paper, They'll often use techniques that I can't remember how it work, and I could go look it up, but it's it, it that sort of feels intimidating. And what the book is about is how you don't need a master's degree in data science or in or in statistics or something like that to see through a lot of the pitfalls that 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 arise because they're they're sort of predictable things like using uh, samples that that don't represent the population you're trying to draw inferences about sampling bias or. Uh, you know, conflating correlation and causation and these kinds of things. And, and so it becomes, you know, these are habits of mind you can easily form and, and spot and we show how to do that. With respect to calling out uh, misinformation, I think, you know, um, Jevin also 
points this out. I mean, I th we think of it as essentially a, a public service, something that we need as part of a functioning democracy. It's also something that's very important in collaboration. This is something, this is a relationship. Jevin and I have been writing papers together for, for 15 years, and it's a service we provide for each other all the time. You know, he'll show me something or I'll show him something. I'll say, hey, look here, you know, I did this analysis. I think it shows this result. He'll say, well, you know, maybe, but did you check this? Can you do this control? And I'll do that and I'll say, oh yeah, thanks. And uh, <laughs> because it'll turn out that he's caught a mistake that I made. And so it's like a, you know, but it's a polite way of calling bullshit. He's not like, yeah, man, Carl, you're a moron. You know, how can you be so stupid? He's just like, hey, try this. And, and then, and then, yeah, I thought so. And, and, and so it's like, it makes me better, right? When he, when he does that. Um, so, you know, the rules that we put out there are, you know, be correct, do your legwork. It's, it's, it's really unappealing to like, be like, ah, oh, yeah, you're, you're full of it. And then it turns out that actually I'm the one who's wrong. Um, be charitable, right? So, uh, you know, never ascribe, uh, never ascribe, uh, malice when, when somebody might've just made a mistake. Um, and, uh, and, and be clear. So you want to think about how you present an argument you know it takes a while to spot bs but then it also takes a while to figure out how to bring someone along for the ride and help them understand uh why you think this is wrong and why it is wrong and so you want to put as much time into thinking about how you're going to explain that as you do into finding it in the first place uh, we think it's really really important to be pertinent because we there you know the internet is full of these you know sort of well actually guys who will like raise these completely irrelevant uh, uh, objections that have nothing to do with the main thrust of the argument just to either be a nuisance or to try to point out that they're super smart or whatever and this is this is not constructive and so we talk about that and it's super important to admit fault because we all make mistakes sooner or later and you know the the you know the sort of first rule of arguing on the internet seems to be always double down on your own stupidity. But we really urge people not to pursue that route and to say, you know, yeah, I was wrong about that, and uh, and then and then clean that up to whatever degree you can. Um, and so these are some of the messages that we try to get out there about about the calling side, which I do think is really important. You know, we did, as Jeff and say says, you know, we chose to to title the book calling bullshit, not spotting bullshit. And it is because we think that, you know, a solution to the, the problem of misinformation that's, that's surrounding us and just general bullshit um, is going to take more than individual abilities to see through it. It's going to take, you know, sort of concerted social effort to, to clean up the same way that uh, we saw, you know, we had a, big in the United States, we had this big uh, sort of, you know, pollution crisis in the in the 60s and 70s. Um, and people decided that they wanted to clean up the environments that they lived in. And we really managed to fundamentally change, um, you know, both air pollution. I mean, it's a bad week to say that with all the fires, but to, to most of the time change air pollution to change all the litter that people were we're leaving around. And, uh, and it was something we were able to do collectively. And we think that, you know, now we spend so much time in these information environments, uh, but they're really polluted right now. And then we all need to kind of stake a, you know, step up and recognize that we have a role to play in cleaning those environments up. And that's why this book is about calling bullshit instead of just about spotting it. Well, thank you both very much indeed, Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West for a great discussion and a thought provoking book calling BS, the artist skepticism in a data-driven world. So you, um, in this discussion and in the book, basically say we all have to be alert for BS at a minimum in everything uh, that we come across. So I would urge everyone who's watching and listening um, to pick up a copy because it, this book will help you do that. So <laughs> thank you both once again. Um, and just a reminder uh, to all of you who have um, tuned in for more podcasts, do go to intelligencesquared.com. And thank you all for listening. I'm Linda Yu.